We study billionaires, and this is episode 97 of the Investors Podcast. Today's episode is brought to you by RealVisionTV.com. Real Vision is the number one video on demand channel for finance where the world's greatest investors provide full length interviews and behind the scenes access. This is a service that Stig and I both use every single day because of the enormous value and insights we gain from listening to billion dollar portfolio managers. If you want to test out Real Vision TV for one week free or get a 10% discount on your subscription, use our coupon code TIP, which stands for The Investor's Podcast today. Broadcasting from Bel Air, Maryland, this is The Investor's Podcast. They'll read the books and summarize the lessons. They'll test the waters and tell you when it's cold. They'll give you actionable investing strategies. Your host, Preston Pish and Stig Broderson. Hey, hey, hey. How's everybody doing out there? This is Preston Pish and I'm your host for The Investor's Podcast. And as usual, I'm accompanied by my co-host Stig Broderson out in Denmark. And today we've got a book for you. And this was a book that we thoroughly enjoyed. And uh, we're excited to talk about this one because this just was released recently in April of 2016, and it's by the billionaire Phil Knight. So if you don't know who Phil Knight is, it's because Phil isn't really a guy that goes around talking about his business or is just a really well-known billionaire, even though his net worth is $28.1 billion. For those of you out there that know who Phil Knight is, he's the founder of Nike. And so this book was really exciting for me to read simply because Phil took a completely different turn than most people when they write kind of their memoir. And this book was written by Phil, which was just awesome because a lot of the times you can tell that it's not necessarily written by the person that's, they get a ghostwriter or whatever, but you can tell he wrote this book. And so what's so awesome about the book that I really liked is he tells the story about the start of the business. He goes back to the early 1960s when he was just starting, you know, as a student in Oregon and talks about the entire experience as if he's like reliving it. And most of the book is all about the start of Nike and kind of getting to that point where they really started producing a lot of sales and had some big numbers and the whole process that led up to it. A book that kind of comes to mind was the one about Boone Pickens. You know, I thoroughly disliked that book. It was not a good book and Stig's not in his head. <laughs> that was, <laughs> go ahead, Stig. It was not a good book. Yeah, Preston, you're it right. It was bad. It was a bad book. And most of it was all about like him now and the decisions that he made after he already had a net worth of like, you know, a hundred million dollars plus. And the whole book was about that. So you really don't get that sense. If you're a person listening to this and you're trying to get your start or maybe you're in college or whatever. It's really hard to have any type of correlation to that person's life in your life. And that's where this book was totally different. So I love the fact that it was all about the, all those steps and all those heartaches and, you know, putting people's shoes on, you know, that came over to his parents' house whenever he started his first company. Like those kind of things were what this book was all about. And so I love that about the book. Phil, he's really good at building up characters and. You're definitely right. You feel like he is reliving it, but you're reliving it with him. It's not a, a really a management book or how to make the best business decisions. Quite the contrary, if anything. It's more about his life and his emotions. And I think in that sense, you could be a business person reading this. You could be a you know, completely other type of person reading this, but just listening to the lessons about life, of all that he's seen and experienced, all the disappointments, all the successes, I thoroughly enjoyed that with the book. I know it's a good book whenever I'm listening to it in my car because I listen to this one in audibles. And just if you're listening to this and you want to listen to this book on audibles, go to our website and click on our link through audibles because you'll get your first book for free. But anyway, I know it's a good book when I'm listening to it in my car and I get to my destination and I continue to sit there in my car, even though I need to get out and go do whatever it was that I was going to do at the destination. I continue to sit there for like another 15 or 20 minutes because I'm, I'm enjoying it so much. Without further, you know, talking about the overall opinion of it, let's go ahead and just dive in and start talking about the, the whole book. So this all starts off and Phil talks about, you know, his time in Oregon and he's a track runner, but he talks about, you know, being on the team in Oregon, just kind of what it was like to be 
a runner for Oregon, and more importantly, he talks about one of his coaches that he had at Oregon. And the name of this gentleman, his last name is Bowerman. And he always talks about Bowerman in this context of being this authoritative figure and this guy that he really looked up to and that was really kind of hard on them, but somebody that everyone respected. And so that was their coach for the, the, the team. And so Phil ends up writing this. And didn't he go to, did he go to Stanford when he wrote his? Yeah. He goes to uh, Stanford and he writes this business proposal. He had to write up, you know, it was one of his assignments. He had to write up a business proposal and he's talking about going over to Japan and because the, the exchange rate and everything at this point in time, which is in the early 1960s, because of the exchange rate, he can buy shoes over in Japan at a discount and bring them back over to the States and sell them for a profit. And so he writes up this whole thesis, this whole business plan of doing this uh, whenever he was a grad student at Stanford. And so, you know, he really was just fascinated with tennis shoes and like he really got involved in, in this research and really became fascinated with this whole project that he did. You know, one thing led to another, but he never really kind of hung up this assignment. He just really felt like, hey, I could actually do this. This could actually be something that I could do. Really, just to put this into context, this was not, it's not like today, right? You can just fly to Japan. But it was very different back then. Clearly, you could also fly to Japan, but the mindset was very different. It was not something you just did. And also keep in mind, this is not too long after Pearl Harbor. And Americans, Japanese weren't really getting along that well. So for a young kid like that, just to travel to another continent and not knowing the culture, not knowing the language and wanting to import shoes. And he had no capital, by the way, either. It was definitely a whole other ball game than today and you can set up those all those internet shops and you can have someone else take the risk of the inventory and so on. So it was just a very courageous, some might say stupid decision. I think if Phil Knight was here, he would probably say the same thing. We'll get to some of this later, but just to give you an example, you know, whenever he started negotiating with these Japanese, again, he didn't have the money. So sometimes he would place order and then go to a bank and say, you know, I already placed an order. Could you please help me out with some cash? Because he knew they would say no if he didn't the other way around. So we'll get to a lot of that later. But it was just just that in itself just shows what a unique character Phil Knight has. I think something else unique that he did with the book is he came up with this idea to do this thing in Japan. And so he went and asked his father if his father would pay for him to basically take this trip around the world. And how old was he here? He's in his mid-20s probably. Yeah. He goes to his father and he's like, hey, can you give me some money to take a trip around the world. Like I want to go to Hawaii. I want to go to Japan. I want to go to Europe, all these different places. And he convinces his dad to do this. But what's, what's interesting about in the book is he talks about this emotional relationship that he had with his dad at that point and like how he was frustrated with his dad. And what I love about the way he wrote this is he wrote it as if he was back in his body, back in the 1960s, of the, of the way he felt and the way he had this emotional you know, response to his father. And that all comes out in his writing style. And it's really quite amazing because obviously his dad wasn't a, a bad guy because he, he paid for him to travel around the world back at that point in time when he was in his 20s. So you know, he obviously had a great relationship with his father, but that didn't necessarily come out with the Phil Knight of today. You, he did a great job of being able to relive those emotions and capture that in the way that he wrote this. I mean, the guy's a fantastic writer. So the, the writing in this book is just phenomenal. So Stig got a little bit into it. So let's go ahead and dive down this. So his dad pays for him to go on this journey. He starts off the journey going to Hawaii with one of his friends. He's there on the beach. He's just like, this is amazing. Do we even want to continue this or do we just want to set up shop right here on this beach in Hawaii and never move ever again? <laughs> Eventually, he does move on and he flies to Japan. And so, you know, we got we go back to the episode we did with Jesse Itzler, the billionaire NBA Atlanta Hawks owner. The guy just makes moves. I mean, just totally makes moves. And that totally came out with this book on Phil Knight. The guy flies to Japan. So most people, I mean, you don't speak the language, you get to Japan, like, what do you do now? Like, how do you even begin to set up a meeting with one of these shoe companies as a 20-year-old something nobody who has no business? 
He has nothing at this point other than the fact that his dad gave him some money to travel around the world. So he finagles a deal to go in and, and meet with the Tiger Shoe Company. And Phil Knight was one of the main reasons that those shoes came to America. He sits down with the Tiger Shoe Company and he's like, hey, you know, I think that we could bring this shoe to America and I would like to be that guy and I'd like to sell, you know, your shoes over there and and whatnot. So they are very respectful and they ask him, well, what's the name of your company? Well, Phil didn't even have a company. He had nothing. He said, um... And he thought of the first thing that he could, that came to his mind. And he was like, thought back to his room at his house. And he had a bunch of his blue ribbons that he had won from his track races and his track meets. He had blue ribbons all over his wall. And so he just blurted out, Blue Ribbon was the name of the company. <laughs> <laughs> so they are like, Oh, and then they, they, you know, Blue Ribbon, Blue Ribbon all down the, the boardroom where he was meeting with the Tiger Shoe Company. And so, lo and behold, they make him an offer. They're like, okay, well, you know, we need something like $5,000 or $2,000 back then or whatever it was for the first shipment of shoes. And we'll send you however many shoes for that amount of money. And then, you know, if you sell these, let us know and we'll send you another, another set of shoes. So they give him a sample and, you know, he, he continues his trip around the world. So let me continue with, with the rest of the trip. So he goes to Greece. Is this correct? Where the whole name of Nike kind of comes up. And I'm, I am absolutely horrible with Greek mythology. I mean, probably one of the worst people on the planet when it comes to Greek mythology. I don't know any of it. But I do know that the god of Nike is an important character. Stig, can you help me out here? Because I am. Yeah, that- it's the uh, goddess personified victory. That's how bad I am in Greek mythology. <laughs> okay, so that's the end of the world trip. So he goes back to America and he's just waiting and waiting for these shoes to show up from Tiger Shoe Company. And they're just slow and lethargic. And then finally, he, he finally gets his first shipment of shoes. And so he takes the shoe because he had so much respect for his old coach at Oregon, Bowerman. And he takes the shoe to Bowerman and he says, is this a good shoe? Because... Um, one of the things that he talked about early on in the book was Bowerman was absolutely just obsessed with finding a, the right shoe. He felt that a lightweight shoe that had the right support and everything gave runners a very distinct advantage. And so Phil was like, this is the guy I got to go talk to because he was always so adamant and constantly changing and trying to research what the best shoe would be whenever I was at Oregon. So he takes one of these tiger shoes to Bowerman to get his opinion and, and kind of tells him about his research paper at Stanford and how he's going to start selling these things. And, and Bowerman, you know, and I think Bowerman had a really quirky personality the way that he kind of describes them in the book. And so Bowerman looks at the shoe and he's like, wow, this is, this is a great shoe. And so he's, he's there at like having a lunch or something in a cafe with the, with his old coach and, you can tell the relationship between Phil and Bowerman is quite awkward. Like he still looks at him as like an authoritative figure and like he's the coach and he still feels like maybe the student at this point in time. And so Bowerman looks at, at Phil Knight and he says, I like this so much. I'd like to go in 50% with you on your blue ribbon company. And Phil is just totally blown away. Like cannot believe that he has. And correct me if I'm wrong, Stig, doesn't Bowerman have like this really prestigious background in running? Like he's won a bunch of major events and trained some like amazing people, maybe even like Olympics and stuff like that. Yeah, definitely. And yeah, he's he's quite the character. And I think he bought like 50% for $500 or something like that, which might seem like Bowerman is a great businessman, but I'm really not sure because after this, actually after they, they get uh, Nike uh, up running, he writes a book about how to exercise and it was a huge success, at least in some sense, because he sold like a million copies. But in that book, he's actually saying, and I, I see that you're laughing now, Preston, because you know what I'm about to say, that the shoes that you're running in, it's really not that important. And he owns a shoe company at that point in time. I mean, how's that a businessman for you, Preston? <laughs> <laughs> and so Phil talks about the first time he read this and how upset he was because this was his business partner for the shoe company. So that was kind of their start. 
So when you think about the start of his business, here he is. He's got these shoes that he's buying from Japan, uh, probably at maybe 50% off of the price that he's selling them for in the States. And then he's, he's going around to all these different shoe stores across, you know, Oregon down into, uh, California area, really kind of just the West coast. And he's trying to sell these things to just regular shoe stores. I mean, that's really his business is he's a, he's a retailer or kind of like this distributor, if you will. He's a distributor to the retailers. And so he starts off with 300 shoes was the first order. And then it just continued to kind of grow. So he sells those 300 shoes. He raises enough money to make another order and he doubles down. You know, the way that they really talked about was he starts off with 300, he goes to 600, then he's at 1200. And each time he basically had the money from the previous sales in order to buy the next set of shoes. And so from a business model, when you look at his company, and it talks about how he'd go back to get loans to help him pay for the next lot of shoes because he wanted to buy more because his demand was there from these shoe stores that he was selling it to. But every time he'd go back to the bank, the bank would look at him and be like, listen, like, dude, you have no equity at all in this business. Like, There's no retained anything. Every dollar that you make, you spend again on more shoes. So he had no equity on his balance sheet, if you will. So We talk a lot about the financial accounting, how to look at businesses. This is a business that Stig and I, you know, would absolutely pass on (laughs) even considering (laughs) because the financials were so bad. And so the bankers are giving him such a hard time. Like, we're not going to lend you a million dollars. Like, what do we get back if you fail? Like all these shoes from Japan, like we want some cash in a bank account or something to to show for, or, or at least a building. You know, he's running this out of his parents' house. He's still living with his parents. So that was his start. And he talks about this frustration and anger that he had for the bank and how they couldn't see what it was that he was doing. And that his numbers were doubling and tripling in like short spans of time. And that there was this enormous demand that he was creating by selling these tiger shoes in America. And so I found that discussion just really interesting to hear it because He goes into so much detail talking about his emotion, what his numbers were and how well it was growing. Like it was just a fantastic way to like really relive this whole experience. Like if you want to step back and see what it felt like to be like the founder of Nike at the infancy stage, like the startup stage, you've got to read this. It is such an awesome description. I think one of the highlights that I have is it really comes back to some of the things that Jesse Isler said about being passionate. And in, I think Jesse was using the example of being a musician. Well, being a musician is not only you know, receiving rewards and have you know, lots of fans. That's not what it means to be a musician. It means to travel around, to be rejected, a lot of other things that, that really comes with the territory. And I think the secret to Phil Knight's success is because what we're doing here on the podcast is really to look at very successful people and really decipher what has made them successful. And I think what's really making Phil Knight successful is really to follow him through this infancy stage, that he simply loves everything about it. And it might seem counterintuitive because if you read the book, it seems like he is, I'm not saying he's complaining, but it's, he's talking all about his negative emotions, all the struggles, all the adversity. And it's definitely not an easy ride for him. But still, at the same time, at least I got the impression that he still loves it. He loved the bumper ride to Japan. He loved the whole tension about, will I be bankrupt tomorrow? And I listened to an interview with him recently, and he said actually that he was willing to do this all over again. He would love to do this all over again, especially the beginning. And I just think it's interesting that he has so much drive, so much passion for doing this. That's really his secret to success because it was not easy at all here at the beginning. There's one thing that really sticks out in my mind from our interview with Jesse Itzler. And it really went, was whenever he said, be passionate about the journey. And man, that may, I, I will never forget that. And you know what? When you look at this story about Phil Knight, that was, I mean, that just reeks out of his writing is that he was so passionate about this journey to create this company. It wasn't, he liked running, he liked the shoes. So, a lot of people might say, oh, he was passionate about running. 
But I would totally argue after reading this book and, and hearing this whole story, he was passionate about this journey of building something big. That's what he loved doing. And, and I love that point stick. Something else I want to highlight that I found really, really interesting when we were reading this was that Phil was an accountant. So he got his degree. And then while he was trying to start this, he wasn't doing this full time. He was working as an accountant. And so he knew the numbers. Okay. He knew the numbers. He understood how accounting worked. He understood that he had to have equity and why the bank was giving him a hard time. I really think, and I know Stig and I say this all the time, it is so important for people to understand the terminology of finance in order to be successful in business because you just understand how the plumbing works whenever you have an income statement. It moves to the balance sheet. Phil Knight could talk the numbers. He could, he could go over to Japan and talk the numbers with a, a full-blown you know, company that's bringing in millions of dollars every year. He was comfortable in that space because he had this accounting background. I think that's so important for people. And you know, Warren Buffett says that the language of business is accounting. And if you don't know the language, you can't you know, communicate with other businesses and people and things like that. So just something to add to that, Preston. I also think, I know this is not like an entrepreneurial podcast in that sense, but I think because there is someone out there who's thinking about starting their own company. And I often advise people to start teaching what they're really passionate about because then they'll get a cash flow why they can start up something else. Plus, they will talk about what they're passionate about with other people that are passionate about that. And I think that this is a really good highlight. So whenever you see these people, like look at the founders of Google, look at Jeff Bezos, look at Phil Knight. Phil Knight specifically, since that's the book we're talking about. He had a bridging strategy. This company, this blue ribbon company that he started, it wasn't like he was working at the accounting company and he was like, hey, I've got this idea for a shoe company. I'm going to stop and I'm going to put 100% of my time into this new shoe company that I'm going to start. No, it was a bridging strategy. This was something that he was working two jobs for nearly a decade or whatever it was until Blue Ribbon became so big that the salary he could pay himself completely offset his, his full-time job and it became somewhat stable. But he did that for years. This wasn't just like a one-year kind of thing and then he transitioned into it. And I think a lot of people don't know that. I think a lot of people think that I got to save a bunch of money, quit my job, and then go all in and dedicate. No, I don't think most people do it that way. I think most people literally work two jobs for a long period of time until they know it's a stable enough thing that they can just transition into it full time. I think that's the model that typically works. And I and you're always going to have one offs. But I think when you look back at some of these people that have had enormous, enormous success, they almost always have this bridging strategy where they work two things for, for years before it takes off. So I think that's a tip for people that maybe are in that point or maybe thinking about starting their own business to consider. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, continue talking about the story here with Phil Knight. And we'll quickly kind of wrap some of the rest of this up because for me, a lot of the interesting stuff was early on. And once he gets so big, for me, it got a little bit less interesting. And to be honest with you, he doesn't really go that far beyond really kind of 1980. It really, The story really kind of stops there, which shows you how much he loved that start and that journey up front. You know, Preston, this, this makes me think about, well, again, the, the book, The Power Habits that we're going to cover later. And they're talking about gambling and how people's brain react to gambling. And one thing that they actually observe is that for some people, when they are gambling and it looks like they're almost winning, so they would be put in front of a slot machine and then there'd be like two bars, but then would just not get the third bar and hit a jackpot. It will really reward the brain with the same chemicals as if they won, you know, if you are addicted. And I kind of feel it's the same thing with Phil Knight. So that's my bridging here. Like the best thing is to run a business and succeed, but almost as good is running a business and fail. To me, that seems like he can't do anything else. It is so ingrained in him to be running a business that he's willing to take the biggest risks. This is definitely a good story. It's definitely not how to start up a company book. He had a wife and three kids at uh, the time, and he was willing to put everything on the line to make this succeed. And as I said before, if he failed, he would be willing to do everything all over. And I think, again, it's not something I would do, but I think it's very inspiring 
that some people can be so passionate about the vision. And his vision was really to provide the best shoes for the whole world. And he had a phenomenal spouse that totally supported that as well. And I, he talks a lot about that in the book. It's not something we're going to get into with the podcast, but he talks about his wife and how she supported these decisions. And it was something that they were you know, consciously making as a couple. Real quick about his employees. So he has a friend that he ran a uh, track with at Oregon and he bumps into this guy. He's living down in California. So his last name is Johnson and he refers to him in the book the whole time as Johnson. And Johnson was just a workaholic. He hires this guy pretty much through commission, right? Stig, like however much he would sell, he gets a cut of whatever that is. So Johnson's living down in California, fills up in Oregon. And so he's, he's basically pushing him shoes. And Johnson is just selling these things like crazy. He's, he is a salesman to a T. And so Johnson is going around all of California. And next thing you know, I mean, this guy is just blowing up California with these tiger shoes. And so Johnson comes up with all these different ideas of like how they can expand and, and grow even faster. I mean, he is just a growth animal. And so he's writing all these letters to Phil Knight. And then through the book, Phil just keeps talking about how he ignored all of his letters and how he would never write them back. But then this guy was just making his blue ribbon business just explode. And so I found that relationship and, and how honest Phil was with really kind of his bad decision making of how he corresponded with Johnson really refreshing. Like you get this feel of how how much integrity Phil Knight has and how he's really trying to capture the truth behind the entire story of how it all happened. And it was really awesome the way that he describes it. I have a good point, Preston, in terms of honesty, because we talked about stories. We've talked about Tibo and Piggins before. We could also include Ted Turner in the equation as well. It seems like there was something that was they were always hiding from us. I kind of feel like I didn't get the whole story, right? And I, I really felt I got the whole story and not all of it was pretty. If anything, <laughs> I think there were more bad stuff than good stuff. But you just kind of felt like he just, he just wanted to tell his story, not how he wanted to be rem- remembered, but what actually happened through his eyes. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. It was almost like those other two books that you referenced were all about the amazing things that they had done and that they only highlighted those things where this was almost the opposite where Phil Knight was telling you about all the things that he did wrong and like <laughs> it was just such a good story. So. Uh, what I want to do is I want to transition to how he basically, how did he transition from selling tigers to building the Nike brand? So it gets a little bit at what Stig was talking about. He blows this thing up. He is selling these tiger shoes almost nationwide at this point. He's selling them all over the place. And tiger basically has an individual, the way that Phil describes them in the book, they have an individual that's in charge of their operations and, and growth within the company. It was a Japanese businessman uh, that represented Tiger. And he was going to basically cut Phil Knight out and basically take over the distribution in the U.S. to all these different stores that Phil Knight had had established that were selling Tigers. They gave him this lowball offer to buy Blue Ribbon, but Phil Knight saw the writing on the wall, what was, what was going down. So... Phil starts preparing for all this and he's like, I've got to create my own brand. I've got to go and create my own shoe, my own shoe company, and then sell that to all these stores and all these connections that we've established through the years whenever we were building this distribution for Tiger. So he doesn't tell Tiger what he's doing. He goes to Japan, he finds a manufacturer, and they create this this brand. And this is, this is something that I found really profound in this book. So they get to the point where they're going to launch their Nike shoes and they're at this convention for shoes, you know, like, uh, all the different Adidas, you know, Reebok or whatever. They're all, they're all there. And so is Tiger. And this was the first time that Phil Knight had basically showed the executives at Tiger that he's got his own shoe company. And, you know, he's talking about how. His boxes were orange, which were completely different than any other shoe company that was selling shoes. And they had their, their setup and everything. And all the, the main vendors that they had you know, worked with in the past came over and they looked at the shoe. And there was a bunch of manufacturing issues that he ran into with the very first shoes. And he was kind of embarrassed with the way that they looked and the quality of the shoes. But 
he had to go with it because they were at that point where they were going to launch. So his shoes are sitting there on, on, on the exhibit and these vendors come by and they're looking at his shoe and they're kind of looking at it and Phil just talks about how insecure he is and how disappointed and, and scared he is as to them just looking at it and walking away and not saying anything. But he actually got the exact opposite response. After these vendors looked at the shoe, they came over and are like, hey, could we buy you know 10,000 of these shoes from you? And Phil was just blown away. And he says, well, well, why? Like he just, he didn't understand why they were just so quick to buy this new brand that no one knew anything about. He, in his, in his opinion, the quality sucked. And he says, why? And you know what the, the gentleman said to him? He said, well, Phil, we've been dealing with you for the last 10 years. And if you've always sold us good quality products, things that, that were, that flew off the shelves and you're somebody that we trust. And that, and that, that word trust just, I mean, just stuck with me when I read this. And, um, it goes back to that power of trust book that Stig and I read, you know, probably, I don't know, 10 or 20 episodes ago. And, he was able to basically convert that goodwill that he had been establishing for more than a decade with all these vendors. And that immediately turned into a sale for him whenever he had a completely different product, something that had never been proven, something that was brand new. No one, they had no idea if they could sell these things. It was a brand that no one even knew, but people were willing to put in big purchase orders because of him, Phil Knight and his team of people because they were trustworthy and they represented, you know, good business habits. And I can't tell you how important I feel that that point in this story was. So one thing I would like to ask you, Preston, is how much is luck and how much is skill here for Phil Knight? Because that's something that people always seem to question whenever they hear about an entrepreneur becoming a billionaire with a somewhat odd idea. And what some of the critics are saying is that he has just been incredibly lucky. One thing is that we have the whole movement. Uh, no one is exercising when he started. And then perhaps by chance, people started to exercise. I'm just going to ask you, how much is luck and how much is skill do you think in uh, Phil's example? So I've got a simple quote that will answer this question. Is it Ford that had this quote, Stig? You already know where I'm going with this. I can see you. Yeah. It's, it's Ford. <laughs> okay. So Ford says, uh, Henry Ford. He says, the harder I work, the luckier I am. And I totally believe in that quote. I think that when you look at where Phil Knight was at this point in time and the amount of work, because he talks about it and <laughs> getting up to that point where I just told that story with, the, with launching the new brand, he had just worked his tail off. I mean, he had worked so hard establishing all these connections understanding what the power of a brand in shoes is all about, which is really celebrity endorsements and all that kind of stuff. Like he understood all this stuff, but the only reason he understood it and had those smarts is because he had worked so insanely hard to get to that point. Was he lucky to get that first deal with the tiger shoe company? Yeah. You might be able to argue that he had some luck there, but you could also go back and say he had worked so hard at understanding accounting. He had gone to Stanford. He had, he had worked hard to get to that point, even for that first interview, much harder than most kids at 25 years old to get to that point. So again, I love that quote because I think it's so true. And I think people that run around saying, oh, I'm not lucky. Well, I would argue maybe you haven't worked hard enough in whatever particular area you're trying to focus on to have luck in order to be able to claim that that's what, what it is. I really love that quote, Preston. And another quote I'm thinking of is Woody Allen's 8% of success is just showing up. And I was, I'm was i just thinking, who is showing up in Japan in the early 60s? No one. Well, there was one guy. That was Phil Knight. Yeah. So very interesting start to Nike. Now, he does get into talking about how he, how he saw celebrities as being the cornerstone to building this brand. When you hear him talk about this, it's really quite an interesting conversation. And you can see how powerful that is because when kids or adults see a celebrity on TV playing a sport and they go running by and they've got a Nike swoosh on their shoe or whatever, it's just, you know, that has so much power for him. I think we'll kind of wrap it up there, Stig, because really that's kind of where it ends. And it 
doesn't really go too much further into the story. He gets a little bit into some aerospace engineer comes to the company with this idea for uh, putting air into the bottom of shoes, which was kind of a little bit of a, a neat story. But then it really kind of stops and he kind of wraps up the entire book about Nike before you really kind of get into the Air Jordans and kind of all the success that he had from 1980 on is not even talked about in the book. So if you're really wanting that portion of Nike, you're not going to get it. If, but if you want everything before it, you're absolutely going to get it in, in ex- just like tons of detail. It seems like after all his early struggles and really, really become successful, the stories he tells there, well, first of all, they're really not that interesting. And it just doesn't seem that important to the story either. And he goes into a lengthy discussion about whether or not it should go public uh, and eventually actually uh, does go public and how it is to be running a company that is always cash strapped. And it seems like it go under every day, but at the same time, it's extremely valuable. How do you handle that? I think that's something that most entrepreneurs can probably relate to. I can only say that really to understand how it is to be a business owner from the early 60s and the next two decades, I think this is probably the book to read just for that. Okay, so something that Stig and I really want to do, because we haven't done this for a really long time, is play a question from our audience. So uh, right now, that's what we're going to do. Okay, so this week's question comes from Naftali. Hi, Preston and Stig. My name is Naftali. I'd like to thank you for this wonderful community you guys have built, which has really enabled me to learn a lot and has helped my friends and I take our first steps into the value investing world. When I tried to calculate the margin of safety, I like to look at the book value and imagine what would happen were the business to liquidate tomorrow. If I buy a company for less than its book value and it goes bankrupt, I could actually make a profit. But in reality, there are many companies that trade for below their book value. For instance, uh, Fiat Chrysler. Is it possible that the numbers in the books don't reflect the real liquidation value of the company? What tools can I use in order to estimate the true liquidation value of the company? And what other ways do you guys recommend I more accurately assess my true margin of safety? Thank you very much. So I love this question. I absolutely love this question because I think a lot of people, whenever they start out with the value investing, they latch on to book value because it's very easily understood. For somebody listening to this and you might not know what book value is, it's simply the equity that's in the company. So let's just take Nike, for example. If we were going to take Nike today and we were going to add up all their assets, subtract their liabilities, and the money that would be left would be the equity. And so when you talk about book value, all you're doing is you're taking that equity and you're putting it into a per share basis. So let's say that the equity is $100,000 and there's 100,000 shares, the book value would be $1. That's how you would figure that out to make it simple for everyone to understand. So what Naftali's talking about is he's saying, if I can go in and I can buy a company that's below its liquidation value or its book value, so let's go to that Nike example. Let's say the book value is $1 per share. If I could go in there and I could buy Nike, let's say it was selling on the on the stock market for 90 cents a share, I'm actually buying it at a cheaper price than their equity that they have on the books. And so you will see this. You will see this in, in real companies right now, even with super high market valuations, you will find companies that are in this situation right now because the market is very high and overvalued. You can find companies like this, but I almost guarantee you what you're also going to find with a company like that is that they're not profitable. They're not making money. And so what the expectation is, is because that company is not profitable, they're not making money on their income statement. Because when you're talking book value and all the assets, liabilities, you're talking the balance sheet. When you're talking about companies like this and they're losing money each quarter, the expectation is that the book value next quarter will be lower than it is this quarter because they're losing money on their product or or their service. So that's the consideration. That's what you've got to think about when you're buying a company potentially below its book value. Why is it so cheap? Why are other people not willing to pay a high price for this? Well, it's because the company's losing money. They're not even profitable. So that's a very strong consideration. And you have to look at that. So what I would tell you is, depending on where you're at in the credit cycle is where I would look at where this is more common versus not common. If you'd go back to late 2008, 2009, even 2010, and you saw companies trading below their book value, 
they could be profitable companies, but they're just being punished because of the severe credit contraction that occurred during that point in time. So I would look at a company much differently back then than I would today where market prices are sky high if I saw a company that had a price selling below its book value. Because now you got to, now your consideration at this point, if it's selling below its book value with a sky high market price and when we're at in today's market in 2016, as credit contracts and it becomes harder to pay off those debts, a company that's not even profitable today is definitely not going to be profitable as credit contracts and it gets harder and that environment gets harder. You're going to have a much harder time staying profitable if you can even stay in business at that point. Now, I have one other thing that I want to talk about, and it's this idea that just because a company has positive equity or a positive book value today does not mean that they would go bankrupt at that price. The thing that you see with companies whenever they start to go bankrupt is that they will suck every last drop of equity that's left out of that business before they would go bankrupt. They're going to take on all sorts of debt. They're going to do all sorts of tricky things with preferred stock. They're going to be selling bonds. They're going to be doing all these things that put any value that's left in that business way ahead of your common stock position, equity position, and you will lose all of that money. And that's something that I think a lot of people don't have an appreciation for is just how desperate corporate management gets and how much money they borrow trying to keep that business alive. And you really kind of have two paths that will play out. Either that'll play out and it'll just be total destruction and you will get nothing from your common stock or another company will come along and buy it and who knows where the price will end up compared to where you bought it. Yeah, so I really like the question. I think it's a very insightful question. As Preston also mentioned, a book value is something a lot of people look at, especially in the beginning, but I also think it's something that when people get more experienced, they typically don't look at too much because it's really not a margin of safety. At least to me, margin of safety is more finding a really good, stable business, profitable business that has a higher intrinsic value than what you're paying for it. That's really my margin of safety. I think if you look at margin of safety in terms of a liquidation value, as Preston said, it's probably not what's going to to pan out anyway. And I think the reason why we talk so much about it is, even though this is a general stock investing podcast, we really have our roots in Benjamin Graham and Warren Buffett and the whole value investing approach. And I can see at the base of that, it makes sense to look at book value because if you read The Intelligent Investor and if you read Security Analysis, there is a lot of emphasis on how do you figure out what the liquidation value is. And I just think in general, I think it's not a good approach for 99.9% of investors to be focused on that. You might look at book value because it might give you a glimpse of whether or not the business is overvalued, undervalued, sort of like you can look at the PE ratio and it might be four and it could be an indication that it's undervalued, but you just need like 99 again percent more before you have a coherent analysis of that stock. But if you want to look at the balance sheet and see what is the true liquidation value, I would just, without being too geeky, look at how's the balance sheet weighted? How much is at the top of the balance sheet? And when I say at the top of the balance sheet, it's because the most liquid assets are at the top of the balance sheet. So the most liquid is cash. The more current assets you have, typically, and when I say current assets, it's the assets that you intend to become turn into cash or is already cash within the next 12 months, that's probably what you should be looking for. If you see too much long-term fixed assets, it's probably not going to turn into to cash. So I would say if Warren Buffett would be responding to this question about margin of safety specifically, the thing he's going to really talk about is a adorable competitive advantage of being able to keep the earnings and profit margins where they're at to be able to keep your margin share of of the overall business. So if you're selling shoes, a company like Under Armour coming in would be imposing on that competitive advantage. That's something that he would be looking at as, as far as being able to protect that. That's giving him a margin of safety. And most importantly, his margin of safety really comes down to the price that he's paying. Whatever that discount rate that he's expecting to get, call it 
if I buy Nike today and I get a 10% return and the rest of the market's giving me 5%, that's a margin of safety because I'm, I'm getting such a larger return at the current price that's being offered. Now, those aren't the real numbers. I'm just using those as examples for people. But that's where he sees his margin of safety. When you talk about book value and Benjamin Graham and where this whole idea of book value originated was with Benjamin Graham back in the early 1930s, this was more for a person that had enough money to take a controlling share of a business and basically liquidate the company because they were able to take that controlling share. That's where that's at. As as an individual stock investor that won't be able to take that size of a position where you actually control and have the ability to liquidate the company, you can't do that kind of stuff. But that's what Warren Buffett and Benjamin Graham were doing back in the day was they'd find these companies that were trading below their liquidation value. They could take a position high enough in the company to actually influence that. That's where a lot of that stuff comes from. All right. So Naftali, we're going to send you a free signed copy of our book, The Warren Buffett Accounting Book for asking your question. It was a fantastic question. If somebody else out there wants to get their question played on our show, go to asktheinvestors.com and you can record your question. And if we play it, you get a free signed book in the mail. So that's all we have for you guys. If you'd like to read this book via audio, make sure you go to our website, click on any of the links for audibles. You'll get the, this, this book completely for free or any other book that you want for your first book. We can't promote that highly enough because you get a free book and you get to use an awesome service that Stig and I use literally every single day as we're driving or whatever. It helps us to be able to do multiple things all at the same time by reading audiobooks. So that's all we have for you and we'll see you guys next week. So one of the things that Stig and I are very strict about is not endorsing any kind of service or product that we don't personally use ourselves. So with that said... We give our full endorsement of our sponsor's content, realvisiontv.com. Real Vision is a site that Stig and I personally use ourselves, and it has had a profound impact on the way that we view the financial markets. One of the most important things a person can do is seek the knowledge of highly successful investors and business leaders, and more importantly, understand their thought process and how they make decisions. And with Real Vision, you get exclusive and in-depth interviews and presentations from the world's sharpest independent analysts, fund managers, geopolitical strategists, economists, and investors all in the same place. And right now, because you're listening to this show, we have a special offer for everyone in the TIP community. If you go to realvisiontv.com and put in our special offer code TIP, which stands for the Investor's Podcast, you get 10% off your subscription to Real Vision TV. And if you're not sure if you want to get a subscription to the site without seeing the videos and content first, we completely understand that. That's why Real Vision is offering the TIP community a free week trial to see if you like their service. So trust me. You cannot afford to ignore the value that Real Vision creates with these in-depth, full-length interviews from famous investors like Kyle Bass, Jim Rogers, Tim Ferriss, and many more. The people being interviewed often have a net worth far exceeding hundreds of millions of dollars, and watching Real Vision is like being able to sit in the corner of a room and listen to a conversation that you're not supposed to have access to. So don't pass up this amazing offer to tap into the world's smartest investors all in one place and go to realvisiontv.com. Don't forget, use the discount code TIP for your free week and 10% discount today. Thanks for listening to The Investor's Podcast. To listen to more shows or access to the tools discussed on the show, be sure to visit www.theinvestorspodcast.com. Submit your questions or request a guest appearance for The Investor's Podcast by going to www.asktheinvestors.com. If your question is answered during the show, you will receive a free autographed copy of the Warren Buffett Accounting Book. This podcast is for entertainment purposes only. This material is copyrighted by the TIP Network and must have written approval before commercial application. Thank you.